I'm interested in a common core of things that are common to all our civilizations. I'm a mathematician, but for me that's particularly interesting. As we look at different civilizations, there have been different things which are not common, which are different and are not compatible. But there is a common core, common to everyone, which seems to be shared. That core is important because we need to know how we can preserve the things we have. So the issue here is, what is the common ground? Why? How do we preserve what we have already? How do we grow? How do we improve? Somewhere in that common core, I think part of it is something which we understand as a way of reasoning, a way of thinking about problems, which scientists and mathematicians these days think of as scientific and mathematical reasoning. I don't think that's something special or unusual to this society. I think that's actually a survival trait, and that's why it's common. It's a survival trait which everyone in our species shares. If we look back into the past, then philosophy, mathematics, and science can be traced back over some 6,000 years, even more. Sometimes it's evolved in different forms, but in every case, every human civilization has had all three, philosophy, mathematics, science. I'm not going to talk about philosophy, because that's very culturally dependent, but I am going to talk about mathematics, and I am going to talk about science. Mathematics and science, when they begin, are actually very practical subjects. They're about solving problems which are immediate and important. So, for example, 6,000 BC, a shepherd up on a hill counting sheep. One, two, three, four, five, six, many. Hasn't changed very much today. My long-suffering partner will tell you. There she is, counting her cats. One, two, three, four, five, six, too many. <laughs> but actually, things have changed a little bit. Let's start in, for example, pre-Columbian Central America. If we look at the Mayas at that time, then they had an amazingly sophisticated mathematics and an incredibly sophisticated astronomy. They were a very populous, for a while, civilization, very high-density population, and very active, thriving culturally. Meanwhile, half a planet away, in Mesopotamia, there was another culture, slightly different time scale, slightly different time region, they invented the wheel. Very, very practical bit of science. You wouldn't get very far without the wheel. They invented the wheel, they invented the arch, they invented writing, they invented irrigation, agriculture. One interesting innovation, I think I'm right in saying that they were the first society to have an organized, specialized labor force. No unions, just the labor force. In the Indus Valley, in India, Another civilization, this time, and I find this absolutely astonishing, they actually understood the tides well enough to have tidal locks. That's quite amazing as an engineering achievement. They had tidal locks, they had docks. Think of the region they're living in, think of the climate, think of the place that they're living. What did they need? They needed sanitation, so they had sanitation. They had urban planning because it was important for survival. All these different properties, they also had the first, I think the first, certainly one of the first, uniform systems of weights and measures. So these were all solutions to everyday problems. Go to China, what are they doing? Well, they have trigonometry, they have algebra, they have geometry, they build the first planetariums, they build the first flying machines, they have fantastic records of solar eclipses, supernovae are recorded, Comets are recorded, all this amazing stuff going on. In Greece, things just start to change a little bit. Yes, trigonometry, yes, geometry, yes, analysis and number theory and applied mathematics. But also a slight shift, a shift away from thinking of science and thinking of mathematics as being purely a practical means to an end, and a more introverted look, and the subject as an abstract area comes into being. And that's actually a very, very important change. And it has consequences. And even that is common, because although it wasn't at the same time, China, India, and Greece all independently develop systems of logic, independently. So this is something which is core to what we are as human beings.
Meanwhile, Europe is in the doldrums. For a while, in Europe, it becomes difficult for individuals to even defend the idea of putting forward a proposal and looking to experiment to justify their reasoning. And for a while, times are hard. And it's only when empiricism re-emerges or emerges as an idea that we start to see science and pseudoscience separating again. Chemistry, alchemy. Astronomy, astrology. Now, things are not quite so rosy because even today, how many people read their horoscope in the last month? Hands up, be honest. <laughs> it's not so bad that you read them, but the fact is lots of people still believe them. And if you follow the newspapers and the news, you will know that people who are important, men in positions of power and influence, not only do they read them, they believe them and they act on them. And that is scary. <laughs> So the situation hasn't changed completely, but it has changed a little bit. For example, alchemy we now know as nuclear physics. And one of our great discoveries is that actually changing gold into, lead into gold is possible, but it's not really economically viable. <laughs> um, so these things are still around. We have other things which are, I think, dubious still around. We have homeopathy and we have chemistry. And there is a, some inkling of a common idea there in the concept of a catalyst. Actually, I overheard a comedian, so I'm going to quote him because I think this is excellent. If homeopathy is right, then we should all be able to get absolutely smashed on sparkling water. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but it is important that there is this balance between experimental science, experiment, and theory, and theorizing. The two things are different, but they're very, very important. And to my mind, they are key and they're central to every society and every civilization that we've actually ever had. They're that important. Our own civilization is still relatively young. It's actually quite surprisingly young when we look at the achievements that we've had. So we've sent men to walk on the moon, tick, yes. We're reaching for the planets, yes. We've done some amazing things technologically, artificial limbs, super fast trains, the web, these are all amazing scientific achievements. What is it that our society has that has enabled us to do this? And I would argue that one of the things that it has is this lovely balance between experiment and theorizing. Not too much of one, not too much of the other. It's no good to have collecting stamps, lots of data, don't know what to do with it, don't know how to arrange it. It's no good having lots of abstract theory and not being able to check any of it or test any of it. We need both, and that's the power of this. And when you also throw in other things that we have, that we're fortunate to have, a population with access to education and a population with access to communication, it suddenly becomes clear why all these successes are now so possible. I want to talk a little bit more about this balance between empiricism and abstraction. What have we got? What are the key features? Well, precise definitions, imagination, can't do anything without that. Watertight arguments, simple practical rules, common sense, observation, and evidence. None of these things are really contentious. They're all ingredients in science. They're all ingredients in mathematics. But actually, that's a pretty decent list for ingredients in lots of disciplines. A legal system which had precise definitions and common sense in it is not a bad start. Even if you're running a business or in commerce, writing contracts, dealing with issues. All of these points are useful. These guiding principles are useful in life, not just in science and in mathematics. So the idea is that if our population grows into a habit of thinking about problems in a way which uses these principles and uses these ideas, then that population is in a much stronger state, a much stronger position to think clearly about problems and to make decisions. And that's incredibly important. If a population can do that, then it actually becomes extraordinarily difficult to mislead people and con people. Slogans, sound bites, charismatic, dangerous people have a much harder time. How do you missell something to somebody who can work out percentages? and actually has enough savvy to go online and see the feedback and talk to their friends? How do you, as a politician, 
sell a vote-winning idea just around the time of election, which is totally non-viable. If the population you're selling it to actually know the issues, understand the issues, and have thought about them. It's really very, very straightforward, and these are very important ideas. How do you rabble-rouse? How do you get people to form a mob if it's become emotionally unacceptable for every man, woman, and child to actually act without thinking about what it is they're doing? I'm not saying here that we expect ordinary people, the population, to go off and learn really difficult science, difficult theories. That isn't necessary, that's not their job. They do other things which are equally important and useful. But what is useful for them, for them to know is actually to understand the kind of reasoning that goes into formulating an argument and the kind of reasoning that goes into questioning results, questioning answers to questions that they are in a position to ask, checking that the answers they get make sense, talking to their friends and finding out what their friends think as well. Those are valuable and those are important. And it's true that this kind of thing can lead to social change. If, in a society like ours, we don't participate and we don't cooperate, then we're actually standing to lose everything people before us have worked for and fought for. If the general population doesn't feel comfortable, if a large part of it feels disenfranchised, then the whole system will fail. If a large section of the population can't be bothered to participate, can't be bothered to vote, then pressure groups take over, and again, eventually, the system collapses. So actually, it's very, very important to bear in mind that we need this kind of thought, and it's useful for us. What's useful is to teach general population, everybody, to teach everybody not the details of difficult science, but how to think like a scientist, how to be a little bit more like Sherlock Holmes when it comes to looking at everyday issues, ordinary issues, just to take a step back and ask the question, does this argument that's being thrown at me in the newspaper or whatever it is actually really genuinely make sense? That's what's important. The challenge then is to promote mathematical and scientific literacy in all spheres. That means going home, teaching the kids, learning for yourselves, me learning some more, how to apply these modes of thinking, these modes of reasoning to ordinary, everyday problems. Not gee whiz bang coffee table science, that doesn't teach you anything, but just ordinary problems. Where I grew up, it was possible to look out of the window in the morning and see the local kids trying to get some old jalopy to run, on a breath and a whisker, usually. And they did learn something. What they learnt was how to solve problems. You can't do that with modern cars, they're too complicated. But with the old ones, you can. They learnt how to solve problems. They learnt how to read manuals. The most important thing that we have and that we can give our kids, and why all this has worked so well so far, is attitude. Can learn, can do, can think, can change my life, can change your life, can change the world. Thank you.